On a small hill just off the highway in Stanton, Virginia, there is a place that is home to some of the darkest history in the state of Virginia. A place where records are mostly gone, but legends run wild, and stories are told from former patients. This place is said to be one of, if not the most haunted place in the state, and that's just from people who have walked the grounds without knowing what lies within its walls. This place is the Dijarnet Sanitarium. From brutal operations and experiments performed on patients, to ties to Nazi Germany, and said to be exaggerated death tolls of up to 10,000, as well as demonic entities trapping and torturing the spirits and souls of the patients that haunt the location. Today we are going to look at the history, the haunts, and the many legends of Dijarnet Sanitarium and learn about the man who started it all. Dr. Joseph Dijarnet was born on September 29, 1866 in Spotsylvania County, Virginia. He graduated from the Medical College of Virginia in 1888 and considered himself the genetically gifted descendant of colonial Virginians and practiced at Richmond's R.E. Lee Camp Confederate Soldiers Home for a year before joining the staff at Western State Lunatic Asylum in Stanton, Virginia. Desjarnet became the first president of the Augusta County Medical Society in 1904 and in 1906 he was appointed superintendent of Western State Hospitals. Reflecting the reform ethos of the progressive period, he revamped the hospital's therapeutic standards, banned physical restraints, unlocked many patients' room, and instituted more sympathetic treatment. During his administration, the hospital expanded in size, including a number of buildings and additions Desjarnet designed himself, and one of which bore his name. In 1932, adjacent to Western State, he opened a self-supporting, semi-private mental hospital for middle-income patients, which two years later the General Assembly renamed the Desjarnet State Sanatorium. Desjarnet was in the vanguard of Virginia's eugenic sterilization movement. In his 1908 annual report, he recommended that the state prohibit marriage among the insane, alcoholics, epileptics, syphilitics, people with tuberculosis, and the feeble-minded. Desjarnet argued that mentally disabled people should be sterilized because it amounted to a crime and a burden on society to allow them to procreate. He relentlessly demanded that the state pass a sterilization statute, and building on the eugenic theories of the country's most prominent scientists, he gained recognition as a leading authority. After 16 years of lobbying, during which Desjarnet spoke before medical societies, social workers, university students, and reformers, the General Assembly authorized eugenic sterilization in 1924. Desjarnet performed many of the 1,200 operations that occurred at Western State during his tenure. Beginning in 1933, when Nazi Germany instituted the world's most ambitious sterilization program, Desjarnet closely watched its progress, and in his published annual reports, he reported favorably on Germany's programs. In 1934, he implored the General Assembly to broaden the scope of Virginia's sterilization law. The Germans, he complained, are beating us at our own game and are more progressive than we are. It's also said that between 1930 and 1932, he, was, he exchanged letters with Adolf Hitler. In 1943, Desjarnet was criticized before the State Hospital Board for his autocratic style and the decrepitude of Western State Hospital. His staff defended him, but the board removed him from the superintendency effective on November 15th of that year. Desjarnet remained in charge of the Desjarnet State Sanatorium until 1947, when he died on September 3rd, 1957. In 1932, the Desjarnet Sanitarium opened, named after the man who many Virginians saw as a future-thinking champion of the people. It was a private ward of Western State Hospital, and Desjarnet acted as its superintendent and had considerable control over the treatment in the facility. People with mental disabilities lived in the sanitarium, but in the early days of modern psychological treatment, it was also home to poor people whose families could not afford to care for them. Many of these patients were sterilized, though not at the sanitarium itself. They were sent to Western State Hospital for the procedures. Out of the 8,000 people sterilized in Virginia, some 1,200 of them were reported to be operated on at Western State, with some close to 500 being at the Desjarnet facility. 
Though Dr. Desjarnet's sterilization practices were dark, they weren't the worst of his work. He used the inmates in his asylum as guinea pigs in various experiments. These included blood transfusions between patients on the opposite ends of the psychiatric spectrum, such as taking blood from a hyperactive patient and injecting it into a depressed one. He also used extreme x-ray exposure as a method of sterilization, which almost certainly would have left its patients with adverse side effects. Following the atrocities of the Holocaust, the trend of eugenics in the United States went downhill quickly. Dijonet continued to support sterilization, though, leaving his reputation tarnished. His quote that Nazi Germany was beating us at our own game certainly didn't help his case. And in 1947, when he was removed from the board, he started turning back on some of the eugenics practices, although some people say he never truly did. After he left the hospital, it was renamed to the Dijarnet Center for Human Development in the mid-60s. Then it was transformed into a children's hospital in 1975. 1981 was a year of drastic change for the center. In early 1981, the Dijarnet Center for Human Development began an effort to service patients throughout the year. Prior to that time, the young patients were sent to their parents' homes or therapeutic foster homes each weekend and went for extended visits during the summer to their parents' homes. Additionally, the former adolescent unit of Western State Hospital was shut down and minors of adolescent age were permanently transferred to Dijarnet. This was the apex of the scope and size of the Dijarnet Center. A concrete above-ground pool was constructed and was in operation until the late 1980s, at which time insurance costs became excessive. In 1996, the Dijarnet Center relocated to a new 48-bed facility adjacent to the grounds of Western State Hospital. And in the early 2000s, the Dijarnet Center for Human Development was shut down. Now that we've looked at some of the history of the man who started the sanitarium and the sanitarium itself, let's look into some of the legends. Now this place is, it definitely has a legend or two about it. A lot of the records of what went on there, they either don't exist because at that time it wasn't a requirement for these facilities to carry permanent death records, uh, operation records, different things like that. So a lot of what actually took place there, we don't know. And there's a chance we may never know. I have spoken with former patients. I worked as security for the local ghost tour the last year they had tours that went up to the Dijarnet building. And I met some patients that were there, there during the 60s and 70s. And even after the eugenics experiments were said to have stopped, there were still some messed up things going on. You had people that would show up and kind of like I described earlier, their families couldn't afford to keep them so they'd send them there and they would show up and be pretty much perfectly fine. And then a few months to sometimes half a year later, they would have a bunch of diseases or they would have some new neurological problem that could only be caused by a side effect or mental trauma of something. Even during its time in the 60s, I've been told that it was known to be a scary place. Some patients uh, have told me that they would tell ghost stories about shadow people that would walk the halls. And sometimes you could see ghost kids walking up and down the road that led to the front of the sanitarium and sometimes playing around the pool. So even as far back as the 1960s, when this place was still a regular sanitarium hospital, it was known to be a very haunted place and a lot of people were scared of it. And you know, who knows, maybe there was some form of, I guess, energy that was already on the property from years prior. And you know, it almost acted as like a beacon for spirits and that for every traumatic incident that happened there, it just added more fuel, more energy for the spirits that were there to begin with to feed on. Because the history of the land, the place that sits on the little ridge before it became a sanitarium, it's not really known. Um, during when I was doing research for this video, I couldn't find any evidence, records, mentionings of there being houses there, if it was hunting lands, not really anything because the town that's in Stanton, Virginia was settled around 1740. 
So between 1740 ish and 1932, it appears that not too much went on on the property unless a lot of stuff went on. It just wasn't reported. So some of the things I've also heard about the place, and once again, these are legends. This is not backed up by actual historical record. So these stories, these legends, they may be true and they may not be true. But the thing about legends is there's always a kernel of truth. So as I talk about some of the legends that I've heard from people, keep that in mind. The main one that sticks out to me is it is said in the basement of Dijarnet. Dijarnet, he came up with an idea for basically a gas chamber. And his idea was you lock the patients in this room and fill it with different gases, then it might have uh, almost like an alleviating effect on whatever their mental condition is. And sometimes, and it was said to be very lethal, but he still believed in its potential, its possibility. So no matter how high the death count rose in the Dijarnet gas chambers, he still kept it going. Uh, another story that I've heard about the place is behind Dijarnet, there's, it's a little building. It looks almost like an outhouse, but it's got a really big smokestack on it. And that was the crematorium of the place. And one of the stories I heard is it came out in 1932 when it opened. And it said that after a week of Dijarnet being open, they, there was a request submitted to Dijarnet himself from the city of Stanton to stop the crematorium because it was being used too often and there were some people saying that smoke was leaking out uh, coming out of the smoke stack at such a fast pace that it almost darkened the skies and it would waft its way downhill a little bit to the town itself and there were some people that said that it was being used between 10 and 30 times a day its first week so you look at it like that, you have between 10 and 30 times seven. I mean, <laughs> that's a lot of deaths. That's That could have potentially happened just the first week alone. Now, the thing I've always been interested in with Dijarnet and when I was making this video, I wanted to find out was a mentioning a record of deaths. How many people did die there? Because, you know, like I said earlier in the video, it's, it's said to be up to 10,000, which over at Western State Facility, there is a cemetery with, I believe, 3,000 graves. So the fact that there may be thousands of people that died at Dijarnet, that's not out of the realm of possibility. And the 3,000 graves that are at Western State, those are just the graves with tombstones on them, not the ones that were buried in, some people say, unmarked mass piles, body pits. And I've heard a few stories that when they were digging up the in-ground pool, when it was a private school and a kid center in the 70s and early 80s, that they discovered uh, some mass burial pits and that it stopped construction for a little bit. The kids had to be kept inside because they didn't want people to see it. And they didn't want anyone to know exactly how many people died there. And it's also said that whenever there were inspections done, they wouldn't exactly be fully reported back to the General Assembly. As for why this is, no one knows. And as for whether or not that's true, no one knows. Dijarnet is one of those places where there's that absence of historical fact. There's the absence of truth and knowledge of what really happened. And in situations like this, local legends, urban legends, they run wild. And this is one of the pl places where the legends run the wildest. It's also said that Dijarnet, if he didn't like certain patients, they got on his nerves or they were taking up too much of his time, he would just have them killed. And then there was there's a pond that is very close to Dijarnet. It's actually on the left side of the building. And some people say that their bodies were dumped there. As for whether or not these legends are true, like I said, I don't know, and maybe no one knows, but I've always held out hope that somewhere, whether it's in state archives, maybe even hidden in Dijarnet still to this day, 
there are records that we can look at and know the true story of Dijarnet and whether or not it truly was as messed up of a facility as it's claimed to be. Now let's talk about some of the paranormal activity at Dijarnet Sanitarium. One of the main claims of Dijarnet is that Dr. Joseph Dijarnet still roams the halls. Some people have claimed to see him standing in his office, uh, roaming the halls, and some people have even heard him yell, get out. Now, Dijarnet is also a place that is said to be one of the most demonically infested locations, potentially on the East Coast. People have reported seeing many red eyes, groups of red eyes, in the hallways, mainly the second floor is where most people see them. People have seen objects levitate in the air. Some people have had strange mental problems, such as hearing strange voices in your head that's not your own voice. Some people have described a sensation almost like something is trying to get in their mind, but they can't see anything and they think they're crazy because they feel like they're being attacked by something they can't see or hear, but they can feel it. There is also on the outside, there are shadow people that have been known to, in a weird way, guard the building. Some people say that if you go up there alone at night, shadow people will slowly surround you and they'll close in and try to lure you into the building to where they say you're, you never come out the same again. There's also the story, it's a very sad story of this little boy who was a patient there during the 1950s, 50s or 60s. And when the boy went there, he was left by his parents. They couldn't care for him anymore. And so when he went to the facility, he was fine. Nothing was wrong with him. He was just abandoned. And within a few months of being there, he lost the ability to speak. And then a few months later, he lost the ability to walk. And he was confined to a wheelchair and something that he would do is the nurses they were very attached to him because even though he couldn't walk he couldn't speak he was still very kind very sweet to them and so they would take him on walks they would push him around the property outside as much as they could even when they were on break their one time they're allowed to leave the facility they would still take him with them and when they would leave to go home he would try and follow them out the front gate to their cars as to where they would always respond, I'm sorry, you can't go with us. You have to stay here. And then they'd have to call security and security would take him back to the sanitarium. Well, the little boy, after about six or seven months of being there, he ended up passing away. And immediately the nurses, especially the ones that were very close to him and the doctors, they reported when they would be outside, they would hear his wheelchair. And some people would say that when they were driving away in their rear view mirror, they could see him in his wheelchair sitting at the gate wanting to join them and leave once and for all. When I was working security there, one of the very last nights we had the ghost tour, it was me and one other person we were doing a security check on the property which meant we would go up to the building pretty much by ourselves with flashlights and we would walk around to make sure that no one had stayed behind no one tried to break in that kind of stuff and i remember we were walking down the front road that led to where the front gate used to be and there was the unmistakable sound of a wheelchair behind me and the person i was with and both of us we both heard it at the same time we stopped and we turned around no one was there. So we kept walking and talking, and then you could hear the gravel behind us being kicked up. And you could hear what sounded like someone following us on a wheelchair. And, and this happened all the way up to the gate. And when we got there, we turned around and I told the spirit of the little boy, I knew exactly who it was. I said, I'm sorry, but you can't come home with us. And part of the thing that you have to do when that happens, this has happened to other people, and you have to walk back up to the sanitary and basically escort him back to, you know, as the legend goes, where he belongs and where he must stay. And it's a very, very sad story. But one of the main encounters I remember having 
is it was the second week we had the tours. I was at the back of the group and I was walking around to make sure everyone was staying in this uh, certain area where the main guide was telling the history and the haunts of the place. And where the old, go there used to be a golf course and the golf course is where some people say most of the mass uh, burial pits are and that they still are to this day. Uh, but nowadays it's overgrown weeds. And I saw somebody standing in the weeds. And so I walked down there and I said, hey, joint, come back up here, not supposed to be here. And I remember seeing the weeds move very fast towards me. And so I backed up a little bit, it caught me off guard, and then the weeds stopped. And there was nobody there, there was no sound. And I remember feeling eyes on me. And so I looked down the main path and I saw a shadow person. It looked to be about six feet tall. It looked like a normal person, except they were all black. It was a shadow figure. And the figure looked at me, took two steps forward, and then inhumanly, it did like this weird slide into the weeds. And I went back up to join the rest of the group because, you know, I didn't want to be in that area, especially since I was about 30, 40 yards from the building. I thought, you know, this could have been anybody, um, especially the weeds. I thought there were people that would go on the tours and they'd try to break in. And so I didn't know if it was one of those cases. But when I saw the figure slide inhumanly, there's no way a human could have done that. I knew it was one of the shadow, quote unquote, guardians of the property that either try to run you off or trap you inside. So throughout the rest of that tour, which the old tour used to go into the night, like it would be pitch darkness when you're there, but when we had the last tours the last month, it would, eve, it would end right at dusk when the sun is just setting. And so I was standing by this old tree where there used to be a wooden swing where some of the kids would play. And it was weird because I saw a little movement in the weeds out of the corner of my eye. And then I looked, I just said, you know what? I'm seeing movement. I know I'm seeing movement. So I faced it head on. And every 10 seconds, you could see what looked like shadow figures, about five and a half, six feet tall, moving throughout the weeds as if they were watching us. Sometimes they would get closer. Sometimes they'd be far away. But the most I ever saw at one time was three. And that was, that was a little disturbing simply because of, you know, you had that feeling that, oh crap, it's so close to the tour group, but there's nothing I can do. What's going to happen? You know, I knew the legends that some people said that they were aggressive. And so I was just waiting at any moment for one of the people in the group to freak out or something like that. But the main experience I remember from Dijarnet is there was one night we were having the tours and part of the tour is after we would talk about the history and the haunts, you could walk around the front and the right side of the building, but you couldn't go to the back, you couldn't go to the left side. And this one person came up to the main guide and said, I hear footsteps in the building. And it wasn't out of the ordinary for people to sneak inside, break in, and they try to mess with people on tour. Now we hadn't had this problem so far that year we were lucky but when you would get close to this one window which is mostly boarded up now but some people they've knocked out part of it to where you can see inside just a little bit you could hear what sounded like heavy footsteps and when i first heard the footsteps it sounded like someone with boots on and so i called out inside i said hey is someone there and the footsteps stopped and then they started up again halfway down the facility someone else started hearing footsteps the same thing it sounded like heavy boots and so finally the main guides we all got together and said hey we need to get people away from the building we don't know if these people are armed we don't know the situation let's just try to get people as far away from the building as possible so we started to do that and then there was this weird it sounded like a knock like boom 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 coming from inside the building close to where the front door is and so, you know, we were thinking anything like, is someone locked inside? They're wanting to get out. What's going on? Is someone messing with us? And so me and one other guide, we walked up to the building, to the left side of where the uh, foyer was. The foyer 
if you see pictures, there should be one on screen now. Leading up to the front, there's stairs, but there's little side rooms. I've never been inside, but there's little side rooms that I guess duck down because there are some windows that's basically at ground level, close to the foyer. And at one point, I put my ear up to the board, very thin board, and I could hear what sounded like whispers, but it sounded almost like teenagers. And so I was thinking, okay, someone's broken in, we might have to call the police. But then people started hearing voices coming from the weeds behind the building, behind us. And so it was, we were hearing stuff inside the building and people were hearing stuff in the weeds, as well as some people were saying, hey, I saw something, I saw someone. So it was in a way almost like we were being surrounded. And that seems to be a common thing with uh paranormal activity at Dijarnet is it seems to almost surround you and try to close in and it's not a really good feeling and so finally I got the idea that I was going to knock back to see if there was a response and so I did just two knocks boom boom on the window and about 10 seconds later there was this it almost sounded like something heavy dropped but it was a response. <laughs> it sounded almost like when you drop, um, you know, like a heavy uh, box and it goes boom. It sounded like that, but there only there were two of them. And it sounded like it was coming from somewhere inside the building, but very close to the window I knocked on. And it was weird because even the people outside, we had the main group about 25 yards from the building, they all heard it and it echoed and it seemed like the sound lingered a few seconds longer than you would think a quick sound like that would linger we never did figure out exactly what it was but we ended up ending the tours a little bit early that night um, i was told that security ended up going up there at the local police and that they didn't find anything no evidence of anyone in there so as for what the sound was i don't know now, Dijarnet, for those of you that's followed Fife Paranormal, you will know that one of my favorite locations in the entire world is St. Albans Sanatorium in Radford, Virginia. Now, St. Albans is where I have had my scariest encounter in the paranormal field. It is the most active location I've ever investigated. And on certain occasions, it's the most evil building I've ever been in. Just the way the energy gets in there sometimes. But at Dijarnet, when you're there outside at night, just look at the pictures on screen and picture yourself first off being 16, 17 years old. And it's just you and one other person in the pitch darkness with just flashlights that barely light up the building. There is an energy to that place that, you know, it makes St. Albans almost look tame and basic. I, I think there's more to the history of Dijarnet, not just when it was a sanitarium or even when it was abandoned, some of the stuff that's allegedly said to go on. There's even some people that said satanic rituals went on there, a uh, human sacrifice. Uh, the lo some people have even said that the local gangs use that as an execution place. It's just, it's a building with a history doused in blood. But when I'm there, I get the sense that there was already energy there. There was already something that was stalking the grounds, maybe even long before uh, the first settlers came to that area in 1740. As for what it is, I would love to go back one day and do a full investigation, even if it's just on the outside. Uh, nowadays, they don't allow people on the grounds even, but one day i would love to go inside because some people there are crazy stories i have heard such as you know doors opening and closing on their own um people watching items levitate i've even heard a few stories of people that have seen objects materialize out of nowhere like um they're walking down a hallway and all of a sudden in the middle of the room this coin just appeared like right in front of them, they saw it form, take shape, and it had physical mass to it. As in, they could actually pick it up as if it was a regular quarter or a 50 cent piece. 
So a place like that, especially to where it's been quote unquote abandoned since the early 2000s. And one of the creepy things about it, I saw a video of someone who broke in from earlier this year and in certain parts of the building, the electricity is still on. And one of the reasons that I'm assuming the electricity is still on is because the people that currently own it, they've been trying to sell the property for years. And people have quote unquote purchased the property, but something always happens to where they back out. Um, when the buildings were being shuttered, all the windows were being replaced with boards. It was said in the story I was told by many, many people is that they had to call in a new construction crew because the first construction crew, they showed up for work one morning a few days into the project to the sound of blood curdling screams coming from the attic, the first and the second floor of the building to the point to where it started hurting their ears when they got inside. And they said it sounded literally like hell on earth. Just this predominantly female screams and screeching and moaning. It was just, it was a sound unlike ever heard before. And so that construction crew quit. I also heard stories that construction crews that have worked around the property as well, not just inside when they were officially closing it up, is that their ladders that they were standing on would levitate and lift off the ground with people on them. Sometimes their lunches would disappear, their lunch boxes and tools would lift up into the air, levitate, and then fly towards somebody as if they're trying to kill them. Literally, just uh, one story I heard is that this workman's screwdriver lifted up into the air and just like in a horror movie pointed at him and then flew towards him straight on as if it was trying to stab him in the brain and so Dijarnet is one of those places that for every thousand legends about this place there's maybe one historical record that we have and so it's always been my dream one day to get inside the building and you know learn the truth what really went on here? How many people really died here? Who haunts here and why are they still here? So maybe one day, one of us will get that opportunity. I wanna thank you all for listening to this part of the video. The next part of the video is evidence from a spirit box session I attempted on the grounds the very last day we had the ghost tours there. Now, to my knowledge, this is the only video of a spirit box session being recorded on the property. And I recorded this spirit box session really out of the blue. I just had the PSB7 and a voice recorder. That's all I had. And then I put away my voice recorder after a while so that I could film with my phone and document it. And I was being stationed that night next to where the offices used to be on the very right side of the building. And I, the most interesting response I remember from that session is I asked if Dr. Dijarnet was present and a voice said, here. So for me, that was always one of the coolest experiences. And for the rest of this video, I'm going to isolate and clean up and amplify all the recordings that I made. And I want you to comment below what you hear and also leave your thoughts on what you think of Dijarnet. When you look at the pictures and you hear the stories that I'm telling you now, what comes to mind? If you have abilities, whether you're an empath, a clairvoyant, a psychic, what do you feel about the property? And also, what do you feel about the responses I was able to record during my spirit box session there? Do you like us coming up here doing the tours? Is this building haunted? Are you protecting the hole in the wall? He's not the other said get out. Like get. Why are you so angry? Do you hear that? I can, okay, I either heard the double, or I heard the double something. Yeah.
This is Jake from Fife Paranormal. I would like to say a happy Halloween to all of you. I hope you all have a great and safe Halloween. If anyone has anything really cool or creepy happen to them during Halloween, whether it be an investigation or just an experience, feel free to comment below or message us. We'd love to hear any and all experiences. But once again, I'm Jake Fife from Fife Paranormal. Leave a like if you enjoyed the video, and have a great day, everyone.